although this talk isn't, isn't about uh, dragonflies and damselflies um, specifically, I think it, it hopefully ties in well to improving the quality resilience of our aquatic habitats. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of background on um, CABI, just to sort of introduce what we do and, and how we've come to be doing biocontrol in the UK. Um, and then a bit on just the general concepts of biocontrol, because not everyone's familiar with it, and then go into the biocontrol project itself. Um, yeah, and as, as Eleanor said, if you've got any questions, do feel free to pop them in the chat. So yeah, so CABI uh, was established in 1910, so we've been going for quite a while now, um, and we're a not-for-profit intergovernmental organization. We're largely development-led, so most of our work is for developing countries. And we started out essentially providing pest management um, services to um, our, sort of our man and woman abroad, if you like. Um, and since then, <clears throat> CABI has evolved, um, and we do a lot across the world, but largely focused at finding solutions to pest and disease problems. Um, we're governed by our member countries, so they all pay a membership fee, and um, the benefits of then the membership is that they have access to all of our resources, our, our digital and, and sort of comms stuff that we do on pests and diseases, so that's a, a huge advantage for all those member countries. Um, and we have offices across the world, so that makes it easier for us in a way to travel and, and collect um, plants and insects when we do our, our biocontrol projects. Um, we're not a huge organisation, we've got 450 staff, and I'm based in the UK in Egham, so um, this is where our, our sort of science base is. Um, but our, our major sort of activity is publishing, and that's done in Wallingford, which is in Oxfordshire. Um, so that's mainly sort of producing books, ebooks, lots of digital resources, compendia on um, all sorts of things from crops to invasive species. So yes, a huge amount of information. And do feel free to look at CABI, our website gives you a, a much more information than I could provide here. Um, but yeah, so as I said, it's largely helping um, farmers and to improve their livelihoods, to increase their yields and to manage pests and diseases. And that's where invasive species management comes in um, and where we work particularly on biocontrol of invasive plants. But as I said, CABI does a lot um, and those are some of our areas of expertise there. So I'll be focusing on invasive species and in particular on plants, on, on weeds as we call them, that have become invasive. Um, we're quite a small team. We're, um, there's only 13 of us um, and we work, we're mostly entomologists and plant pathologists and we have a few ecologists, um, do lots of modelling and socioeconomy. But importantly, we have two DEFRA licensed quarantine facilities. So any exotic plant pathogens or insects that we work on, we can only work on in these contained quarantine facilities. Um, and then huge amounts of propagation space to grow all of our plants. Okay, so now on to um, invasive non-native species, as we call them. So they have been called lots of things from alien, exotic, um, you, but I'm sure you all know that not all non-native species are invasive and only a small proportion of plants that are brought in from other countries go on to establish and thrive um, and cause negative impacts on the environment and the economy. They're introduced deliberately, often, um, you know, as plants for um, growing horticultural crops or horticultural plants, but also accidentally into novel environments. Um, often as stowaways or seeds it, contaminating other products. Um, and then, of course, the aquatic trade. As you know, there's often lots of things mixed in which can get out if people throw them out into our rivers. And um, the, the impact of invasive plants really is across many sectors. Um, and in the UK, we obviously have a lot of problems with the impact of aquatic species in particular, or plant species on tourism, on leisure activities, um, but also on our biodiversity. And often that's less easy to quantify, but displacement of native species, disrupted pollination, um, all of those things have a massive impact on our, on, um, our native species. So um, 
the trade and, and globalization, as you know, has increased this and climate change is exacerbating it. So plants contribute a huge um, problem across the world, with biological invasions and are very costly. Um, so this is from the, the non-native species secretariat. We have a huge number of non-native species across Britain. Um, and the ones that have established and are re reproducing in the wild and cause an impact is only a small proportion, but nonetheless, they're causing huge impacts uh, and very expensive. And so there are a number of plant bans on um, aquatic plants, for instance. Um, so floating pennyworth is, is banned for sale and you're not allowed to cause it to grow in the wild or um, yeah, buy it anymore um, since 2014. And although the UK leads Europe in terms of invasives, um, we do have a quite a lot of good legislation against it and against them and lots of awareness raising exercises. So overall, people are becoming more aware of the dangers of just bringing in things willy nilly and throwing things out into rivers. Um, but it's often quite difficult to control things once they've been around for a long time and things like Japanese knotweed, which were brought in by the Victorians, the Himalayan balsam, have established such large populations that they're very, very difficult to manage. Um, so, yeah, this is just to, to highlight the rate of return on invasive plants and um, animals and pathogens much higher if, if you can control something right at the beginning, or if, even better, if you can prevent them from coming in in the first place, um, then you won't have to spend so much money. But of course, once something is established and widespread, then you're spending a huge amount either chemically or mechanically to remove them. Um, and that's where biocontrol comes into its own really. But that was just to highlight that prevention is, is better than cure. And a lot of funding isn't focused at the beginning because it's almost against human nature. And certainly politicians don't want to invest any money in things when they haven't got out of hand yet. But um, that, that's the best case scenario. So why do species become invasive? Well, the, the plants in particular, huge number of traits that can make them more prone to becoming invasive. And often plants that grow fast, that have produced lots of seeds, all the attributes that gardeners look for, um, and make better invaders. But one thing that they all have in common is that they have arrived in their new range. So they've been cleaned up through the horticultural trade or whatever, and they've lost those natural predators and natural enemies that would generally feed on them in their native range. Um, so they're able to grow larger um, and outcompete our native species because they don't have anything feeding on them themselves. And there may be a few species of insect pathogens that affect these um, new arrivals, but in, on the whole, they're very generalist and they don't have a huge impact on them. So um, the principle of classical biocontrol is to try and redress that balance by using one, sometimes there are more than one, but um, co-evolved insects and diseases. So things that have evolved in the native range with the plant to only feed on that plant um, and to then release those things into the, the new range to see if they will manage them. This isn't a new approach. It's something that's been done for over 150 years across the world. There have been some huge successes, um, great economic returns. Um, and in the old days, I'm, I know we, we always get the cane toad quoted us when we talk about biocontrol, but um, this was done in the 1930s when there was no regulation. Um, and now biocontrol is very much re recognized as being very rigorous in terms of safety. Um, safety is always paramount. There are recognized codes of conduct and the way we test species is, is internationally recognized and the standard is set. So this day, these days, it's, it's much more predictable um, and safety is, is definitely the onus on any testing that we do. So there have been a lot of releases across the world. This is a, a agents against weed target. Um, and in the UK and Europe, it's still quite a new thing. So there have only been five intentional releases of weed biocontrol agents in the UK and Europe to date. CABI have released four of those and, and one was released in Portugal. Um, so it's always nice to sort of refer to other projects in, in other countries where there have been lots of successes. 
but recognizing that in Europe and the UK, it's still quite new. So the, the general model for biocontrol is that you have a plant population, this is your invasive plant, and it's going up and down with the season, so it crashes in the winter. You introduce your biocontrol agent, and the ultimate aim of biocontrol is not eradication, and you won't get eradication with biocontrol because you're bringing that population of plant back down below a certain threshold, economic, environmental, so that those two, the, the biocontrol agent and the, the weed target, cohabit, but in a sort of smaller frequency and um, under this damage threshold. So you're bringing the balance back to the ecosystem, if you like. Um, this can take a bit of time. Um, so overall, um, the advantages of biocontrol are that, that it's environmentally safe, it's cost effective, it's sustainable, because once you've released something, it's self-perpetuating, or at least you hope it will be. Um, and it reduces the vigor and the competitive ability and the, the reproductive ability of the plant. And at the same time, that allows native plants to come back as well as all of the arthropod assemblages associated. But it can take a long time. And so um, often it has taken five to 10 years for a, a population of a, an insect or a pathogen to establish and then to be able to cause discernible damage on the population of plant. There have been exceptional examples where it's happened in a few months or under a year, but those tend to be rare and, and most of the time it's, it's sort of five years plus. So as I said, it's not eradication, it's irreversible because if you release something, that's it, it's out and about, it's going to be very difficult to, to stop it. But um, the testing that's been done on it has been, um, would not, if, it, if any non-target impacts had been detected, it would not be approved for release. So um, not all targets, not all plant targets can be, um, not all plants can be targeted with bio, biocontrol because they, they have to be exotic, but also they may not, there may not be any insects or pathogens on them in their native range that are suitably damaging or safe enough. In some cases, such as giant hogweed, for example, um, Cabby undertook lots of surveys in the native range in the Caucasus. Um, but after a couple of years of research, we were not able to find anything that was suitably damaging or specific to giant hogweed. So that project kind of ended. Um, and often if you invest in biocontrol, so if you've got a certain amount of money up front to, to fund um, surveys across the native range um, and testing of multiple species, then you'll increase your rate of success. And if funders sort of lose interest, then um, often plant species that could have been controlled by biocontrol are sort of left back on the shelf, which is a shame. Um, and importantly, then no health impact. So we know that the damage that pesticides and herbicides can cause, and so with biocontrol, because it's um, yeah, natural control, there are no health impacts. So uh, how do we start the biocontrol project? So once you've got your target, you've got some funding, you can do some literature review to find out if there have been any insects or pathogens recorded on those plant species. You can look back at herbaria specimens to see if there are any holes or signs of rust on them. Um, and then you get to the exciting phase of the project, which is when you go to the center of origin and you look for damaging insects and pathogens on your target plant. So in the case of floating pennywort, um, we had to go back to South America where floating pennywort originates and look for things that fed on it there. Um, once you found something, then you would bring it back to your quarantine facility and you would do your susceptibility testing um, and host range testing. So that's effectively providing the insect or the pathogen, the plants that you don't want it to feed on and to see whether they will feed, develop, lay eggs, on, on things um, that you don't want them to. So if they do, they're out. So you only want them to be able to develop on the target plant. And if they're co-evolved with them, then they have um, yeah, developed to overcome the physiological um, specifics of the weed target. So they won't develop on anything else. Um, just to give you a few examples from around the world, uh, I've chosen an aquatic plant because the, floating pennywort is also aquatic and it's just to give you an idea of the sort of damage um, and control that can be achieved. 
So this is Salvinia molesta, which is a free floating fern um, from South America, which is invasive in over 13 uh, sort of tropical and subtropical countries. And in the 1980s, um, it took over many water bodies in um, Australia. This is a, a lake in Queensland. Um, after researching um, a tiny little weevil that fed on it in South America, it was uh, approved for release. And it was released and then very quickly, in this case, um, it was only after a year or so, 90% of those plants were removed by the weevil. And so at the edges of this lake, you would find pockets of the plant with lots of weevils sort of clinging on. But that would be an example of a, a very successful biocontrol program. And it was replicated across the world and equally successfully. Um, so weevils tend to be the Achilles heel for aquatic plants. So if you find a weevil on an aquatic plant, it's always um, a good sign. So onto biocontrol in the UK. Um, uh, just to give uh, highlight an example, you may have heard of a, another fern, which is invasive in the UK, um, Azola, which is again from the Americas um, and was introduced um, in the late 1890s. So it's been in the, in the UK for a while, um, but a weevil was introduced serendipitously um, on the plant through the sort of ornamental trade of the plant. This weevil was used previously very successfully in South, South Africa to manage this invasive. Um, but in the UK and Europe, it sort of came of its own accord just on, on the plant when it was being traded. So DEFRA consider it to be ordinarily resident in, in, in Britain since 1921. And it's also found across most of continental Europe. Um, and this weevil actually manages Azola in the UK and, and Europe quite effectively. Um, and CABI has a, a small semi-commercial venture whereby we, we mass rear these weevils so that we can top up and augment the numbers that are seasonally quite low um, and just provide a, a more effective agent essentially. And recently the paper has been published to show that without this sorts of background biocontrol that goes on, uh, annual management of Azolla would range upwards of eight million pounds a year. So just goes to show that when biocontrol works and it's happening in the background, plant may not necessarily be considered invasive or may not be causing as much damage as it might have if it wasn't under control. So this is an example of a, a triple SI in Surrey. Um, so weevils would be released on this and depending on the size of the water body, you, you purchase different amounts of weevils and you, you literally just plop them in. And this is after just a few weeks. It has a very fast life cycle, so sets quite a high um, expectation for management of water weeds in the UK, but this one is, is very effective um, and it's a good one to sort of be a flagship for fire control already. Um, other projects we've been doing um, on other invasive plants, riparian weeds, so Japanese knotweed was the very first introduction of biocontrol in the UK and Europe. Um, it was um, in, 19, in 2010 that we released this sap-sucking psyllid from Japan. Unfortunately, the results have been a bit patchy. The, the psyllid isn't um, establishing in high enough numbers to have a huge impact on, on knotweed, which grows very fast, as you know. Um, but the research on the psyllid is ongoing. Um, and then we also released a, a rust pathogen on Himalayan balsam. Um, and um, this is doing much better. It's establishing on um, biotypes of the, the balsam which are compatible to the rust. So there are several biotypes of Himalayan balsam across the UK and the rust is so specific that it will only infect um, a small percentage of, of the biotypes of particular biotypes. Um, and the rusts come from different valleys across Kashmir uh, and India and the Pakistan Himalayan range. So teams have to go back to particular areas in India and Pakistan to find the rust that's best matched to the, the biotypes in the UK. Um, and then Crassula helmsii, I'm sure you all know, um, a, a small mite was released against this in um, 2018. And so still early days with this, but the mite um, also reduces the vigor and the growth of the Crassula above the water. <clears throat> so sort of a watch this space with this one. 
as um, we get more and more results from the field uh, as the years go on. So on to floating pennywort. So this is the project I've been leading since 2010, which started as a package of work for DEFRA um, as part of the Water Framework Directive. So funding knotweed, balsam, crassula and, and floating pennywort to look for um, suitable biocontrol agents for the plant. And there had already been um, some studies in South America on um, natural enemies associated with the plant. So that was a good start. Um, as you all know, um, floating pennywort uh, is from South Central America. Um, it's naturalized in the British Isles, but only re relatively recently, since 1990. So in the space of very, very recent times, it's managed to colonize a huge amount of the UK's water bodies. Um, it spreads incredibly rapidly. It can grow up to 20 centimeters a day. Um, it's free floating on the whole, but it can sometimes root on the banks. Incredibly difficult to control because it fragments so easily and, and seen mechanical scoops sort of break it up. And even when volunteers go along, they can leave little chunks and those soon regrow into plants. So the main damage it does is forming these dense impenetrable mats across water, body, water bodies, um, blocking out light, reducing oxygen levels, which of course have impacts on native species, but also compromise flood defenses, navigation and leisure activities. So this distribution was limited to the south or sort of southerly areas to begin with. It's, it was first recorded in Essex, but it, since then it's established um, across the UK um, and right up to the sort of Yorkshire areas, not into Scotland yet, but um, it's predicted with climate change to expand its range across the UK. Um, so it's definitely one of the biggies for aquatic invasive plants. Um, so yeah, in, in terms of management, um, the annual cost of removal is in excess of 25 million pounds and that's sort of impact on boating and angling. And largely now the, there are sort of canoe, canoeing groups and the kayaking groups which get together and have huge pulling parties where they just go out and spend the whole day pulling out giant mats of pennywort. But as I said, because it fragments so easily and if it just, there's a sort of long weekend of hot weather, it soon grows back and it can go right across from bank to bank. So the project, was initiated in um, 2006, um, looking in the native range at what natural enemies there were associated with the plant. And we found lots of things, um, um, but the literature had highlighted a weevil. Um, work was done by South American scientists saying that there was a very specific looking weevil on the plant already. So we went to Argentina, to Brazil, to Paraguay <clears throat> and found the weevil there. Um, and it's having a huge impact on the plant populations. So the adults are quite small, they're about the size of a, a cooked grain of rice, about half a centimetre. Um, and the adults scrape the leaf and they lay their eggs inside the stem of the floating pennywort. So it's a double whammy as the, the adults feed on, on the leaves and reduce the photosynthetic area. And the, the larvae mine inside the stem of the plant and so feed inside it. And then the whole mat tends to collapse. Um, they're quite long lived, about four months. Um, but they take about 36 to 40 days from egg to adult at 24 degrees. So certainly not as quick to develop as the Azola weevil. Um, so our host range testing, basically a decade of testing of this weevil, um, identifying a test plant list of non-target um, plants. So essentially uh, plants from the same family as hydrocotyle. Um, but also plants that were rare and overlap in habitat, economically important plants. So working with botanists and DEFRA, we developed a test plant list, um, tested the weevil against all of those plants, and we do a sort of sequential series of tests where we, we test the weevils um, on the plant without anything else, any other choice. So it's almost like a starvation choice, um, starvation test where they eat the plant or they don't and potentially die if they don't eat it. And then we give them a choice of non-target plants and hydrocotyle at the target to see if they'll um, always choose floating pennywort. And in this case, the weevils proved significantly um, to prefer floating pennywort uh, and to be specialists on that plant. 
So as I said, we, we tested over 78 species of plant um, between 2013 and 2019. Um, and we also did some climatic modeling, modeling to sort of find out how many generations the weevil could have across the UK, um, since our climate is slightly um, colder than um, Argentina. And then all of that research was then summarized in a, a dossier, a pest risk ass assessment, which was submitted to UK regulators in 2021. Um, and then it was peer reviewed. It went through um, the advisory committee for releases into the environment, the JNCC, all the devolved administrations, then stakeholders had a, a chance to read it and comment, and then there was public consultation. So it was a, a year long process where almost everyone was consulted and all of the research was peer reviewed. And in 2021, we finally received ministerial approval to release the weevil. And that's the license, Holy Grail, for a new biocontrol practitioner. Um, and of course, you have to have good collaborators in the country of origin, which we did. We worked very closely with the Argentinian collaborators. And over COVID, we lost our culture of a weevil. So we had to get a new one imported from the same places um, the original culture was. Um, and so since then, we've been rearing weevils. And this year has been the first kind of large scale rearing and release of weevil across the UK. So essentially, we go from doing very detailed tests, uh, big rigorous testing in the quarantine facility to farming weevils in a sort of large scale polytunnel and growing as much pennywort as we can. We also um, did a lot of molecular work on the plants to make sure that the, the biotypes of pennywort were the same across the UK. Um, it's clonal, so it was always likely that they were gonna be very similar, but it's always important to know so that you can go back if there are any differences to um, adult feeding or development on particular populations. Uh, and the license stipulated that monitoring of the weevil had to be done. It's hugely important once you've got the weevil out to be able to look at the performance at different sites, help to improve the release strategy, how many weevils you need for different um, sites or depending on the amount of pennywort. Um, and then the number of generations that you might achieve at different sites, southerly ones compared to the north. So we take a lot of um, abiotic and biotic uh, recordings at each site. And of course, we look for any non-target interactions, if any. Um, lots of engagement with the public, with all of the, the other actors in, um, and stakeholders in penny work management, because ultimately the, the biocontrol program fits into a national strategy to manage pennyworth and it can be used and integrated into other management programs. Um, volunteers do a, a great job removing mats of pennyworth and we tend to tag along just to collect plant material for our weevils. Um, and so, yeah, so this year, as I said, has been largely about releasing the weevil um, and testing out the things that in, we've done in sort of in containment, so looking at overwintering, um, which we were able to do last um, December in 2021, up to sort of May, just to see whether the weevils were able to survive outside. But now we can also do it practically this winter, um, since we've released at lots of different sites across the UK. So 2,300 weevils have been released to date at over 13 sites, so 19 to so some of the sites have got multiple release points. So right down from Pevensey levels in East Sussex to um, Leeds and Wigan, a really good spread of release sites. Um, and as I said, we're, monitoring is ongoing. Um, we've done a bit of monitoring already at all of those release sites to see how they've done. But um, we'll also be monitoring in April and summer next year to see how the weevils have overwintered and what impact they've had. Here's a sort of rogues gallery of us doing the releases so it's just basically little um, tubs of, full of weevils released straight onto the mat of pennywort um, and then if you look on the bottom left here you can see we sort of look for feeding damage by the adults and then we open up stems and here's one with a, a larva developing in the stem so that's what we want to see really is uh, signs of larval activity and spread at all the sites um, and also in some cases, cows who are very fond of pennywort will come along and feed on it. So we have to yeah, anticipate any potential challenges at all the different sites. 
Um, so we've been working um, also with the Dutch, who've got lots of water bodies and are very keen to have the weevil now it's been approved. So that, that'll be an interesting development. But we're very keen to get things going in the UK first. So lots of promotion and there've been some, some good um, blogs and videos and newspaper coverage linked to the, the Pennywork strategy, but also the press release from DEFRA. So in summary, Biocontrol has been proven globally to be very effective and economic and a benign option for many invasive plant species, particularly when they've gotten out of hand and in places like Australia and New Zealand, you see areas the size of whales covered in invasive plants. So biocontrol is often the only solution left um, and returns on investment can be huge when it works. Um, really important to collaborate effectively with people in country. There are lots of plant species invasive that already have biocontrol programs. So almost off the shelf agents for common targets. So working in collaboration internationally will help reduce costs. Um, there was a lull in biocontrol, but it's on the up again. So New Zealand, Australia, really ramping up their use of biocontrol and in Europe, it's gaining momentum too. And so what we really need is a su success to get more buy-in um, from funders, but certainly no shortage of targets that have to be prioritized obviously because some of them may have conflicts of interest so plants like rhododendron and buddleia which are hugely invasive but also have horticultural value may not be suitable targets for biocontrol um, but i hope that's given you a bit of an insight into what we do um, and i'd be happy to take any questions at the end thank you